fundamental techniques that you'll do in biochemistry. So here's an overview of how it works. SDS PAGE stands for sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. I know this is some really big words, but really it's not so bad. SDS is a detergent, so it's basically like this soap that's going to kind of unfold the proteins, give them a negative charge, and help them stay soluble so that they can swim through this gel. And this gel is made up of acrylamide that's been polymerized to form a mesh. So you basically have um, this gel network with different size holes, depending on how much of the acrylamide you have and how much of the crosslinker, you can get things like a higher percentage gel, you get finer mesh. If you use less, you get a lower percentage, you, know, you have a lower percentage gel, you get a bigger mesh, big, good for separating big things. And how this separation actually occurs is using gel electrophoresis. So basically electrophoresis, we use electricity to send the proteins traveling or foresing through the gel. These gels themselves are typically run in this vertical format where you have these gel this thin slab of gel in between two plates, which are either glass plates or plastic plates, depending on whether you're making them yourself or whether you're buying them pre-made. And then inside of that gel, you have that network, um, that mesh network. You want to use this mesh in order to separate these proteins by their size or more technically, as we'll see, by their length. Now, proteins, they have multiple levels of structure, as we'll see, that we need to kind of denature, we need to undo, we need to unravel these proteins into their just their chains. Because if we were to send these proteins traveling through as is, well, now their shape is going to influence their movement as well as their length. And so we couldn't tell, we might not be able to tell apart a, um, a short chain that's really loosey-goosey versus a big chain that's really tightly compacted because those would travel differently through the gel because of their shape. Um, they might kind of appear more similar than they actually are. But if we were to unwind them so that they're just in their linear length, well, now we'd be able to directly compare them as well as directly compare them to like a ladder of known standards. So in order to do this, what we're going to do is we're going to need to unfold those proteins and get them swimming through the gel, as we'll see. If we can unfold the proteins, which I will hope I can convince you we can do with heat and SDS, well, now we can basically send them traveling through the gel. Now what's going to happen is that the longer proteins are going to get tangled up more on their way through the gel. You can think of it kind of like um, if you were dropping a jump work a jump rope through like a sea of basketball hoops, the long ones are gonna get tangled up more and therefore they're gonna travel more slowly. Now, the traveling is going to be because of the electricity that we're going to generate. So if we turn off that electricity, well, now they're gonna stop moving and they're gonna get stuck where they are. And if we can then stain the proteins to show us where the proteins are located in the gel, we'll be able to see that we're going to have the bigger proteins um, have bands large higher up in the gel and the smaller proteins will be lower down. But first we have to get these proteins to actually move through the gel in the first place. So if we take some protein, how are we gonna actually get it to move through the gel? Well, as we mentioned before, we're gonna use electrophoresis. So we're gonna use electricity. We can use an electric, um, like a power box to generate an electric gradient where we have a negative um, at the top of the gel is going to be negative. So like where we put our samples in, we're going to have a negative charge and at the bottom is going to be a positive charge. Now what's going to happen if our protein is um, negatively charged is that it's going to then be attracted towards that positive charge and this can get it to move through the gel. So this would be a problem though, if your protein was positively charged. So if your protein was negatively charged, sure, you can get it to go in, but what if your protein's positively charged or if your protein's neutral? So different proteins have different charges depending on the makeup of the amino acids that they have. And this is going to be a problem if we're trying to separate proteins by their length, but their charge is getting in the way. So we talked before about how shape could get in the way of how they move, affect how they move, but so could charge. And charge could even prevent them from going in altogether. And so what we need to do is we need to get all of these proteins to have a negative charge. And we don't just need them to have a negative charge, but we need them to have a consistent negative charge, a negative charge that basically the charge is going to also correspond to the length in a way. So it's going to have this direct correlation. So you can't, you, you wouldn't have like, okay, well, this protein has a negative charge, but it's a small negative charge for this big protein. And then this little protein has a big negative charge. We wouldn't want that. Instead, if we really want to compare by length, we need that negative charge to be kind of like consistently 
plastered along the protein. And we're gonna be doing this with our SDS. Um, so basically this SDS, the sodium dodecyl sulfate, um, sometimes you might also use in your sample buffer, um, LDS, laurel dodecyl sulfate, same idea. These are detergents or like artificial soaps. They have this long hydrophobic or water avoided part, this like lipidy part, and then this hydrophilic or water loved head. Um, and basically what's going to happen is that this hydrophobic part is going to glob onto the hydrophobic part of the insides of the protein. So when a protein folds up, it does so so that its hydrophobic parts, the parts that are that avoid water, are hidden in the inside of the protein. Whereas the hydrophilic parts, the parts that are water loved, they're going to be on the outside. And so when you unfold a protein, well, now you're introducing those hydrophobic parts to the water, which would normally cause them to clump up. But when we have this SDS, well, now it's going to glob onto those hydrophobic parts and basically give the protein, um, keep the protein soluble because it also has that negatively charged head, which is going to be okay hanging out with the water. So you get kind of the best of both worlds and those negative charges are going to help it so that the protein is going to get kind of evenly coated. The negative charges are going to make it so that the SDS molecules won't want to get too close together either. So that it's going to keep the proteins linear so that they can travel through the gel. So in order to actually get this to glob on though, we typically need to have some heat because proteins have a bunch of these interactions that we need to disrupt in order to kind of help give the, give the SDS or the LDS a chance to get in there and do its job. Proteins have multiple layers of structure. So if we talk about the primary structure, that's just the sequence of amino acids, but then that folds up to give us things like secondary structure and tertiary structure and quaternary structure. Um, so basically secondary is where you're involving the backbone, tertiary, you involve some of those side chains or like the unique parts of the amino acids. And then quaternary is when you have multiple chains involved. And typically with our SDS page, we're wanting to remove all of those, those, um, those structures except for the primary structure. So we just have that chain. So in order to do this, we need to reverse the folding, which we can do by using heat, which kind of like helps the protein letters to wiggle apart. So it's hard to keep things in a fixed shape if they have lots of energy to move around. So the heat helps them wiggle apart. But in order to keep it reversed, to keep the proteins from just globbing together now that all those hydrophobic parts are exposed, well, this is where that SDS or that LDS is going to come in. It's going to coat the protein and keep it soluble. And remember, it's going to give them that negative charge. So now we have these soluble linear proteins, all with this consistent negative charge. And now they're going to go traveling through the gel. And more on this in other posts, but sometimes what we do is we actually have a stacking gel and a resolving gel. So our stacking gel is going to be a looser mesh, and then our resolving gel is going to be a tighter mesh. And this makes it so that all the proteins, no matter how high up they are on their well when we're loading them, they're going to kind of all get to that resolving gel to that start point at the same time. And then they're going to travel through this gel, the mesh that's a tighter mesh. So basically, if you have a big mesh, everything kind of have an, has an even chance. So even those big proteins can travel like at the same speed as the small ones because the holes are so big. But if the holes are smaller, well, now the bigger proteins are going to have a harder time than the smaller ones. And so then in that tighter resolving gel, they're going to separate. As the proteins are moving through the gel, they're going to be separating, but you're not going to be able to tell it. Instead, what you're just, all you're going to see is a tracking dye. Um, so you have this tracking dye that's going to help. It's going to be in your sample loading buffer, and it's going to help you see the progress of the gel in terms of like just the front of the gel, like the dye front um, is typically consistent with like some of the really, really small proteins. And so typically you let this dye front run out and then you can um, take your protein, at, your gel out and stain it. So sometimes what you will see is you will see like a ladder if you have a pre-stained ladder. So a ladder is just like a, um, a mixture of proteins of known size. And sometimes these are pre-stained. So they have like dyes on them so that you can actually see those bands as it's running through the gel, but you're not going to be able to see your protein gel bands. You're just going to be able to see this tracking dye, which is often like a bromophenol blue. In order to actually see the protein bands, well, now what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to take that gel out of the cassette, so out of the out from in between those plates, and then stain it typically with some comassi based stain. This might be like a classical comassi, which is this really dark blue um, that you have to stain and then you de-stain it um, because you get this really high background. 
or you might have some sort of like colloidal chemassi where basically you have these little clumps of dye and the clumps of dye can't get in um, to the gel, only single dye molecules can. So those clumps, you have this equilibrium between the clumps and the single molecules. Um, and so then this is going to help the gel stain, um, stain without having that high background. Both of these types of dyes are based on Comassi Brilliant Blue. Sometimes we abbreviate the CBB. And basically, this is this blue dye that's going to bind to proteins. Um, more specifically, it's going to only bind to certain amino acids. So you can get a little bit of bias in terms of whether your protein is made up of more of the amino acids that it tends to bind stronger to. But for the most part, you're getting a kind of like generic staining of proteins. And this is going to allow you to see where in a gel a protein is located, and then you can do things like compare it to a ladder of known sizes. And although this is artificially colored black and white, what you're actually going to see is you're going to see some blue bands. And if you're using um, colloidal versus the classical, you might see a slightly different color of blue in this sort of thing. Um, but hopefully you will see blue and you'll see blue bands where you want them. And hopefully if you're trying to purify a protein, you won't see too many other bands. And because it's blue, you're going to see blue bands. And remember that the bigger proteins are going to be higher up and the smaller proteins are going to be lower down. You can do things like see how many pro gels are in a band to see assess things like purity. Like you can tell that this sample is a lot more pure than this sample. You can also do things like see if a protein is being expressed well. So this was showing induction of protein expression. So basically I was trying to see, are these cells going to make this protein if I ask them to? And you can see that over time, since I asked them to, by adding IPTG, you see an increase in that protein band. You can also see the purity of a protein increase as you go through different purification steps and things like this. So lots of things that you can do with an SDS page gel. So this is showing you all the proteins with Comassi stain, but you can also look for specific proteins using a technique called Western blotting, where basically you take the proteins out of the gel and onto a membrane, and then you probe that membrane with antibodies um, that you can use labeled antibodies in order to see where different protein, where, if, where specific proteins are and whether they're present and how much. So the Western blot is gonna show you a specific protein, whereas Comassi is gonna show you everything. Okay, so a couple more technical notes. In terms of what's actually going into that sample loading buffer, we talked about the SDS or the LDS. This is gonna be the detergent that's gonna unfold your protein, keep them soluble and give them that negative charge that's proportional to their length. We also have to talk about a reducing agent often. So when we talk about reducing, this is means that we're like breaking up sulfur-sulfur bonds. These like cysteine, um, these cysteine crosslinks. Basically, most of those bonds that make up that secondary structure and the tertiary structure and the quaternary structure, the proteins, all of those bonds are like non-covalent. So they're kind of like weaker bonds. They're not like the bonds that are actually holding together the amino acids in the chain in the primary structure. So basically, we're able to denature them. We're able to unfold them with just heat and detergent. But there are some bonds um, that are stronger bonds. They're not as strong as the regular covalent bonds that are like holding together the chain, but they're stronger than those bonds that are like there's those attractions that are keeping the rest of the protein in its folded shape. And these cysteine crosslinks, basically we have to add something else to break them up. We add a reducing agent, which is often like DTT or BME. And so we'll add this to the base of our loading dye. And typically once we add this, then we're gonna want to keep it in like the freezer and not just like at room temperature, and we're going to want to um, use it fairly quickly because these reducing agents can, um, can oxidize and go bad over time, and then they're not very useful. But they are useful in break if they're fresh in breaking up these cross links so that you can um, unfold the proteins fully and um, break up any sort of like interprotein interactions that were through those salt, those cysteine bonds. Um, and so much more on that in other posts. But sometimes you actually want to leave out the um, SDS and you want to leave out the um, reducing agent. And this is going to allow you to do what we call a native page where you can see if proteins are staying together. But typically what we're doing is an SDS page where we're within denaturing conditions where we're gonna break up all those interactions and get the proteins into their fully linear um, unbound form.
Also in the sample loading buffer is typically like glycerol or another heavy thing that's gonna keep your, help your sample sink and stay stuck in, stuck in the gel, um, sunk in the gel while you load it because you don't want your sample popping up. So we talked about how the protein could go out of the well if you put, your, put the lid on backwards and have the anodes and the cathode mixed up, but it could also happen if you don't have something heavy in your protein. Um, um, with your protein, so the glycerol is going to help with that. And then we have that tracking dye that we talked about. Remember, it's not showing you the protein, just the position of the dye front. And finally, I just wanted to make a quick note that another gel electrophoresis technique that we use is agarose gel electrophoresis. And so this is often used to separate DNA by size. Um, and so this is going to be run in this like slab format, this horizontal slab format, where basically you have this thicker slab of gel um, it's not in between plates, but it's just kind of like resting on this cassette, and then you have your samples traveling through. The same principles apply, but in the case of your agarose gels, you don't have to worry about adding a charge because the negative, the DNA or your RNA, but typically we're using this for DNA, and if we're doing RNA, we're typically actually running an acrylamide gel um, because it has a finer mesh. But basically, when we have these DNA or RNA, they already have a negative charge thanks to their backbone. And this negative charge, because it's kind of like in that backbone part, that's the generic part, it's going to be um, kind of like a ruler that's going to be consistent with its length. So its charge is consistent with is um, consistent over its length, kind of like how we're adding SDS to make the charge consistent of the length over the length of the protein. Well, with DNA or RNA, it's already that way. So we don't have to worry about that. Although for RNA, we often do still denature it in order to remove some of the like the structure of the RNA because it tends to fold up more. But when we're running like an agarose gel, we typically don't denature it. We just have our sample that is kind of ready to go as is, and it'll stay double-stranded on its way through the gel. But that's typically how we're going to be analyzing it. That's so you understand the SDS page. So remember that the SDS stands for sodium dodecyl sulfate. Basically, it's a detergent that's going to help our protein stay unfolded, stay soluble, and have a negative charge. That's going to help them travel through a gel made up of acrylamide. And basically, this gel mesh is going to separate the proteins based on their size. The bigger proteins are going to get tangled up more in the mesh. And when you turn off the electricity, they're going to be higher up in the gel. You can then stain the gel with a chromacy based stain in order to locate the proteins on the gel. You can't tell what the proteins are, but you will be able to get a sense of what is present there. This is a very common technique you use in biochemistry, and you'll probably get lots and lots of practice with it. And hopefully you won't rip your gels as often as I do. Hope you have a good time with your SDS page and hope this helped you understand it better.